So I start with um, the neoliberal global disorder, and this is just to review. I mean, there are many issues that I think there's a consensus about as far as uh, a new politics would be concerned. Um, and so for me, the, the most frustrating part of it, the most difficult part, or the one perhaps that demands uh, most clearly a, um, a total revolution, as uh, people have said in the last few days, is the fact that global capital, global ecology, global pandemics, all of this uh, is something that we have to confront with the limitations of national politics uh, in the classic way. In other words, the only place we really have power that, uh, that we don't have to create in a new form is on the national level if we have power there. And this, um, this indicates that none of these problems can be resolved within the old political structures, not just uh, uh, the unequal political structures, but the very structure of national sovereignty itself. So this is uh, uh, something that for me is, um, I'm going to try to show evidence that there is work going on, that we have to remember that work has been done, um, and that we may be further toward developing a new political culture than uh, uh, in our moments of desperation we feel. So if it is true that national populations are losing control, not only over capital, but over the social commitments of their governments as well, under these conditions, politicians easily appeal to nationalism in attempts to deflect the real structural inequalities by fostering an exclusionist, racist, and anti-immigrant response within domestic politics, undermining the powerful global solidarity that resistance movements in the past decades have in fact achieved. So in terms of global capitalism, um, here's uh, Piketty's uh, graph, graph of uh, Anglo-Saxon countries, but also emerging countries. And my point here is simply, we cannot just talk about the global south or the global north in terms of income disparities or indeed the enormous inequities of capitalism as there is now an, one success for democracy globally, and that is um, that, whoops, okay, I don't have that image. Uh, the image is of uh, the fact that billionaires exist in communist China, they exist in the global south of India, they exist in Nigeria and other places of Africa, they exist in Brazil and other places in South America. In other words, uh, uh, the ruling uh, uh, capitalist class uh, has, uh, has become interracial, intercultural and uh, has achieved a level of integration uh, that um, is uh, ironically uh, the success of uh, these goals inside of an unequal order. I wanted to bring Piketty and Streich into the conversation. Uh, I don't think they've been uh, on, uh, on the agenda yet. Uh, Piketty is trying to propose international participatory socialism, democratic participation in defining the public good when public today is global in regard to pandemics, climate crises, and massive economic inequality. He wants a redistribution of the taxation system, new institutional systems. Now, obviously, this is a matter of political will. And given the uh, national competitions, uh, Streich is pessimistic regarding the feasibility of all of this. Um, and hence, the uh, in my country, we're trying to return to some sort of democratic socialism under Biden that is uh, totally inadequate, of course, as a response. So there is a real uh, crisis in the alternatives that are in front of us today. Uh, but I do want to point out one uh, interesting um, phenomenon when it comes to uh, the 
uh, global economic systems, you're seeing now um, the very primitive pre-computer attempts of the Soviet Union to centralize the economic production. Uh, and if you follow these little lines down to the very end, you will see that even matchsticks were part of the general plan. Uh, but for Chile, uh, there was an attempt to use, at that time, very primitive computers under Allende to uh, produce a, um, a way to centralize information and then give it back again to local factories, local towns, et cetera. And so that this is the way the Central Committee looked. Uh, uh, and, and so one wonders what socialism is capable of given the technologies uh, of uh, the computer age. But in the meantime, we have to remember, of course, we, we know that crisis is systemic for capitalism. And, but this is something we share. There's no place uh, that, that is immune to these crises. So Southeast Asian financial crisis of 1997, Argentina 1998, USA 2008, uh, and now under pandemic uh, conditions, a global crisis of capitalism again. So uh, there's nothing um, uh, redeeming about capitalism. It, it leads to precarity, not just for some people, but for us all. And I think here I will find the image I was looking for before of the distribution of billionaires in US dollars uh, across the globe. And uh, although there's inequality of their distribution, uh, we cannot uh, make a geographical distinction between the haves and the haves, have nots. Um, this is a, a different kind of problem that we're facing. Uh, yet for the majority of us, uh, and even those who are okay, but living under precarious positions, um, we wake up on the wrong side of capitalism enough to identify with this rather brilliant uh, slogan that came out of the Occupy Wall Street movement. Uh, we are the 99%. If you had said 100%, that would have been uh, hyperbole, but 99% has this uh, uh, lovely um, uh, uh, hole in the idea of universality. There's, there's a, a lack of completeness to any universal statement. Um, in a book that I wrote uh, that came out in the year 2000, I compared uh, uh, the development of uh, modernity in the West with the development of modernity in the Soviet Union. And uh, the, the real tragedy at that time was that uh, this conflation of history as progress leading to modernity was conflated with a, uh, an economic system of modernization through ind industrialization and particularly heavy industry. So that uh, these... Uh, steel factories in Russia were constructed with the help of uh, unemployed um, United States architects who uh, had no work because they were in the middle of the Great Depression, but at this time in the 1930s, uh, the Soviet Union was flourishing. And so they mimicked in the Soviet Union the models of, in, of uh, modernization of the West. So for instance, this is the Hoover Dam completed in 1936. And here is the attempt to have hydroelectric power in, uh, in the Soviet Union. So this, this, this real lament on my part is that capitalism could only be imagined uh, as a kind of mimicking of the very, very ecologically destructive development of the West even though uh, visionaries like Melnikov uh, could imagine a solar pavilion for the green city, which would be, uh, you know, where the energy would be through solar power. So that, that is a real tragedy for me of the 20th century and of the uh, traditional notion of revolution that came out of uh, Marx and modernity itself. And if we look at a city like Brasilia, 
in, in Brazil. It's a beautiful city. It's the dream world of modernity on many levels. Um, and Brazil built it within, I think, five years or something. It was a five-year plan. Uh, and it's extraordinary as a kind of fantasy of modernity. But uh, in 2016, this is uh, Guanabara Bay in Rio de Janeiro, where the uh, Olympics were to be held. Uh, and uh, the disaster of the uh, pollution of the water is quite clear. Uh, but I, I don't have to put up Brazil. I can put up any place in the world. Um, we are all aware of this. This this crisis, this danger, is is uh, uh, something which makes uh, the political will um, makes us aware, gives us uh, a desire for a political will that still needs a revolution. Lots of them. But how will the idea of revolution survive the passing of that modernity to which it has owed its political life? That, that is my question. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think these uh, wonderful words, I don't know if they're still up on Humboldt University, but what I think I, I heard several times during the past few days is that what we're involved in here is not just a theoretical um, analysis, but a mode of action. Again, uh, I'm emphasizing here the will, the desire to do something. And yet the question remains, Lenin's question, what to do? And the question actually was borrowed from 19th century uh, uh, Russian writers. Uh, and in trying to figure out what to do, we're dealing with a moral question we are dealing with a practical question, uh, and we should not um, um, be afraid to enter the realm of morality. I am uh, pretty much uh, sat in German. I'm, I'm pretty much fed up with the idea that all we can do is lament uh, the horror. There's uh, a lot to do, and the sooner we get at it, the better. Uh, but we've learned something in the 20th century. Aha, I see, I can't see part of my screen because I have this thing that's in the way. We've learned something in the 20th century and here are a couple of the things I think we can agree uh, went wrong with the old idea of the revolution. One is that Marxist revolutions have not happened in advanced economies, but rather in Russia, China, Cuba, this means there is no blueprint of history, no stages of development, no one is ahead, no one is behind, there's no waiting room in history. There is no metaphysics of history, no inevitability of revolution that might justify party dictatorship that was uh, um, you know, as the kind of vanguard of the working class. Um, these are important lessons uh, to learn. Uh, and as a consequence, it seems to me, in our actions, experiments in political culture need to replace the idea of party vanguardism. No one knows what we should be doing. And that's why I thought it was very important uh, that in the discussion of uh, Maria uh, uh, 2.0 uh, and aid given to refugee camps, it's very important to have the people in the camp engaged in saying what needs to be done, right? This is not something for the party to decide. It is something for, uh, that has to be the consequence of dialogue. And, um, and um, uh, respect for listening to others uh, and the dignity of what they have to say. I'm also thinking, I mean, there's, there's a possibility there that there could be a, a, a instead of uh, the space of the refugee camp being this kind of frozen uh, land of no one belonging, there could be a production of political culture within these, as there is evidently, uh, when they have um, people listening to what it is that they need when they organize to um, make their own solutions to the problems at hand. You know, we also know that historical development is not automatically progress. This is, in my lifetime, really one of the uh, hardest uh, myths to give up, right? Um, 
the idea of progress, if we give it up, really, it is extremely deep, extremely deep. And one of the phrases that has become important for the movements of the 21st century is Benjamin's uh, statement that Marx said the revolutions were the locomotives of history. Perhaps it is otherwise the reaching of humanity riding in that train for the emergency break. Uh, and this uh, image, images of emergency breaks went around in a lot of the uh, demonstrations that happened in, in uh, 2011, 12, and after that. And it's totally profound. And I, I realize every day how profound it is when I teach the modern thinkers or when I think myself in terms, in modern terms, uh, because history is the myth of modernity. It's history that makes modernity think that matriarchy was superseded by patriarchy, that primitive societies were superseded by developed ones, that Western societies uh, were historically advanced, and that modernity supersedes traditional societies and traditional answers. Uh, it, it's, it's very hard to give this up. And it seems to me it's a little bit of a fig leaf to talk about you know, different temporalities, uh, unless we really understand them in, a, in a, an existential way as opposed to uh, a, a descriptive way of, of time in the historical sense. Uh, so history, you know, anyway, I've been working on a new project where I found that every, every time I even want to use the word history, I'm importing into that discussion some sort of notion of progress uh, where the facts of the past are assembled in uh, vertical slices of history belonging to particular uh, groups or identities, and that these particular groups or identities uh, are, are moving at different speeds toward a future, which is, uh, if it's imagined as progress, uh, makes us assume that the people who are ahead are actually winning when that may not indeed be the case. So I find this uh, uh, phrase of Benjamin, which then comes up all, all over, uh, it's one of the most uh, quoted quotes uh, in contemporary discussions of politics. So I want to look at who the agent of revolutionary change might be today uh, and, and say that, uh, uh, that against Lukács, the working class is not the subject object of history. And therefore, but this is the glory of it, there are no primary and secondary contradictions. Uh, that, of course, is a reference to the way Marxists, in their traditional sense, would look at something like uh, feminism uh, or racism. They would be secondary contradictions to the primary contradictions between the working class and the capitalist class. But it's also true that the revolutionary collective is not the universalization of an abstraction um, in, on any level. So, I mean, I'm, I'm really against identity politics uh, in the sense that it produces these groups where everybody is supposed to be the same because they are subsumed under this abstract category of uh, identity. But we see here then uh, an enormous um, an efflorescence of uh, movements on the street of uh, different groups. And these are just some, I mean, I, I could uh, search and search and search to find uh, images to show you here. But it reminds me that we do have a lot in common. We are working toward common goals, even if there is no uniform revolutionary class. And of course, I'll pause here because uh, that the revolution will be feminist or it will not be, I consider, um, a founding principle of any uh, any uh, revolution of the future. Uh, so, so this these are these are movements that are spontaneously uh, evident 
in so many places of the world that we can't talk about them being a north-south um, uh, division or uh, east-west division. This is uh, extremely broadly uh, the case. And so we can say that the revolutionary collective is already plural. And this is street art after the Gezi Park demonstrations in Istanbul. I hope it's still there. It's quite beautiful. So uh, I want to turn now to how to assemble these different uh, manifestations of a shared political will um, and talk about it in terms of translocal solidarities that might produce a signifying chain across nations and um, create new intersubjectivities. Uh, because the pictures I've shown you do not uh, fit the borders and divisions of either our epistemological categories or our political uh, categories. And there wasn't enough of this in 2011, but there was a start when a movement in Egypt, the, the wonderful Tahrir Square uh, uh, demonstrations, brought uh, uh, solidarity with uh, young people in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and here, uh, solidarity between Dublin and Istanbul against uh, fascism as it manifested itself um, in that country. And here, um, we are all Greeks. These are uh, New Yorkers. You can always count on New Yorkers to understand the multicultural uh, necessity of any kind of political movement. Um, and this is a standing together with Athens that was uh, struggling under the austerity of Northern Europe. That's uh, the point I want this to make. And when Ferguson happened in the beginning of the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, uh, there was a solidarity with, uh, given by the Palestinian people uh, who here are, uh, the poster says, the Palestinian people know what it means to be shot while unarmed because of your ethnicity. And I just wanted to cite Angela Davis here because it's important. She writes, I don't know how the movement of black lives would have unfolded had it not been for the fact that Palestinian activists immediately offered solidarity and were at the forefront of an international uh, solidarity movement that further emboldened people in this country to stand up and fight against police violence. So my point is we must remain visible to each other uh, Tiananmen Square in 1989. China is an interesting case. And Yvonne uh, earlier this morning was talking about how uh, a lot of uh, Africans are looking to China now for education and for uh, for a different kind of aid. Um, but um, it's it, it's um, a big question mark. So. I'm talking now about, about a creation of planetary politics. And this is my answer I, in the blurb about my talk, the word universalism was, was, was written. Uh, and I wouldn't use that word, but planetary politics, I might be okay with. Uh, Ashia used planetary in, in, in the same kind of sense. Uh, universal is not uh, what, what, we can, um, what we can embrace, but planetary, I think, puts the emphasis uh, uh, where it, it needs to be. And here it's true that numbers matter. And here I'm going to start going quickly because I'm afraid that I am not moving fast enough. Uh, I'm just going to remind you of the massive demonstrations that occurred. This is Buenos Aires. This is Gezi Park. This is Rio. This is Maidan. This is the International Women's Day March in 2017 in Washington, D.C. Uh, and 
and and remind us that this um, this all began in 2003 when cell phones were relatively new. And on the day that the United States, or February 15th, there was a, 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 the first real global uh, protest against the imminent invasion of Iraq. And I, uh, and more than 600 cities took place uh, using this new technology to upload images. These are all from that movement. It was it was an experimentation with a new technology to produce uh, a planetary politics. It did not succeed. Quite the contrary. The war started by Bush that following uh, these demonstrations is still haunting us today. So uh, I'm not saying that this is an instrumental po political uh, uh, weapon to be used, but I am saying that it is it, that there is an evolution of a new politics using a new technology that may take longer than we, with our revolutionary impatience, uh, may like. Uh, but a very wise man once told me, actually, the father of uh, Jamie Raskin, who's been on television as a, uh, because of the uh, impeachment for, uh, trials here. Uh, Mark Raskin used to always say to me, revolutionary patience, revolutionary patience, we have to have it. Uh, I will say just a word about revolutionary violence. There should be no fetishism of revolutionary violence. To me, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I am not, uh, I do not think, uh, I had another image of uh, uh, women in Israel in the armed forces. Uh, I don't think that uh, equality in being able to murder the enemy is the way forward. But at the same time, there should be no fetishization of the law. And this uh, I find absolutely chilling. Um, this quotation by Mar Reverend, Reverend Martin Luther King, never forget that everything Hitler did in Germany was legal. Another phrase that has come up, uh, uh, and it's, it, it's uh, in good Frankfurt School style, is expressed in the negative. No human being is illegal. It begins uh, as uh, something that referred to the Holocaust and was picked up uh, by this immigration lawyer uh, to talk about uh, the uh, ban against Muslims emigrating, immigrating or coming into the United States in any way. It led to, uh, this is uh, in New York at the at Kennedy Airport. People immediately went out and, and with these signs saying no human is illegal. And then this sign went viral um, in a kind of beautiful way. So, I guess what I'm trying to say here is if we have some revolutionary patience, the way to prevent an end of democracy is to make democracy the means. Listen to others, see what other people are doing, keep visible to each other, uh, keep on the streets, keep persistent. Uh, and this uh, is uh, an example of one of the successful revolutions that's happened rather recently. Um, uh, I'm, I'm leaving it to the translators to translate the uh, captions and probably shouldn't. So uh, just fall uh, is uh, the, the word for the government, just fall, that's all. And indeed, uh, there was a successful overthrow. It's not clear that uh, there will be a successful revolution, uh, transfer of power. Uh, but these events do happen. Uh, al-Bashir was uh, toppled in 2019. But the question is, uh, are we in a situation where uh, the transitional government will not actually give power to others? And here we have Hong Kong. Um, it's still going on. People are being... Um, extremely brave because the oppression has been consistent. Look what's happening in Moscow. Um, 
in eastern Russia, not just uh, Petersburg or Moscow. And here just very recently uh, against uh, Putin proposing that he have unlimited state in power. Black, Black Lives Matter, of course, in the last year has spread globally. This is Nigeria. Um, again, I'm sorry, because there's not enough time to read all of this, but, uh, and I think the translators are probably just translating my voice and not everything else. But here, for instance, Black Lives Matter, having uh, sympathy or solidarity demonstrations in France, uh, in Kroon, in Frankfurt. Uh, and Chile, which uh, is still struggling uh, to protest uh, against uh, repression. Uh, the bravery is, an, is ex extraordinary. The bravery is extraordinary, but also um, uh, is aided by uh, a sense that this is a planetary movement. Um, there are, however, the dangers of reaction. The Rabat massacre in Egypt, where uh, almost a thousand demonstrators lost their lives. And this one I, uh, I want to focus on because, uh, Saeed, you're on the panel, and uh, one cannot forget that the, the Syrian uh, demonstrations uh, following 2011 in Egypt, these wonderful demonstrations, extraordinary demonstrations in Damascus in Syria, led to uh, this kind of destruction. Um, when uh, the government came down really hard. And this is a, a still seed from your uh, still recording. Um, and I'd like to talk about that. I mean, we have so much uh, lack of success because the, the, uh, the state is still extremely powerful. Uh, and, and not only that, but uh, there are it's a proxy war. This is a kind of outsourcing of, uh, that we've been talking about of the crises of all sorts. Um, and Minsk is another example where a, a fantastic uh, demonstration was put down with horrible results. Uh, so what I want to talk what I want to talk about is how do we keep the uh, solidarity, the uh, political will, the uh, uh, enthusiasm for change alive, given the enormous uh, repression uh, that um, those who are struggling on the streets are always in danger of facing. And would someone tell me how much time I have left? Because I can't hear and I don't know. Uh, and I don't know when we began and I can't get out of this. So let me just uh, try to move ahead quickly here. I just want to put two other things on the table and try to, how much time? Put up fingers, how much time? It's through, it's through. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me just uh, go through images to say, uh, we don't always know what we're looking at. Uh, Glissant's idea of opacity, I consider absolutely necessary. I would take you through the whole problem of Arendt misreading this photograph if I had the time, but I can't. And last, I want to say that I think there's a new aesthetic form that is uh, uh, supporting this uh, global politics or uh, this planetary politics. And the aesthetic form is one of framing incompatible frames and finding unexpected comrades. Uh, and uh, I would love to talk a lot about this film uh, by uh, uh, Milo Rao, uh, which uh, was considered a part of this conference, but we have no time, so I won't. I'll just uh, maybe keep this image up um, and hope that I have, I have sound when I come back uh, to the end of this discussion. Okay, that's it. <laughs> 